All right. So I love this book. Thank you. I thought it was brilliant. I thought it was riveting. I did too. Yeah. yeah. I do too. I still do. I've read it three times now. It's it's amazing. Mm -hmm. It truly is. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, f I feel like um, the best way to start would be to just start with the opening lines of the book because I feel like it gives such yes. a vivid snapshot of... Um, of Michelle's process. And, um, so I'll just read a few lines and then we can talk about mm -hmm. that. But, um, that summer I hunted the serial killer at night from my daughter's playroom. For the most part, I mimicked the bedtime routine of a normal person. Teeth brushed, pajamas on. But after my husband and daughter fell asleep, I'd retreat to my makeshift workspace and boot up my laptop, that 15-inch wide hatch of endless possibilities. I mean, I feel like this book was just as much about Michelle's obsession with the case as, um, as it was about the killer himself. I mean, what was it like watching her go through all this? It was, uh, it, it made me really rethink what the, how I've seen uh, homicide detectives and criminalists uh, portrayed in popular culture, in mass media, because it is a very, very lonely, frustrating thing to decide to take on uh, a case, especially a cold case, where you are, whether you realize it or not at first, you're putting a big chunk of your psyche on the line and, um, and gambling with it because you have to have, a, you have to have this, you know, you have to have a huge amount of empathy for the victims, the survivors, and, and, and also in a very horrifying way, I'm not saying you have to have sympathy for the person, you do have to have a measure of empathy for the killer, for the person that you're pursuing. You have to get inside that person's head as much as you can. And, and, and the act of doing that day after day, I think can really um, eat away at your psyche. It, there's a risk to it. That's why a lot of you know, long time homicide cops are very, very quiet, very, very controlled, go out of their way not to bring that home with them or let that uh, uh, seep into their daily lives because it, it, it can really, really poison everything. Mm -hmm. And I mean, it's hard enough, you know, the, the fiction writers have a higher um, incidence of insanity, I think, than almost any other profession because to be a good fiction writer, you have to let other personalities into your head. And that is a very risky thing. It's hard enough minute to minute just holding your own personality together. You know, it really is. Right, right. Just having one is you're constantly like, wait a minute, whoa. Um, so then to openly admit, but, but, but that risk I think is doubled with a, with a cold case investigation because you are letting, these aren't, you, you don't have the comfort in going, well, these are characters I invented. Right. These are real people. And then this is a real mysterious, faceless, you know, monster out there that I'm letting share some real estate in here. And so that, you know, watching that day to day, you know, I would see the insomnia. I would see the waking up screaming if, if I came in late at night or if there was a weird noise, the, the sound of uh, our neighbors taking their garbage out at night, that's, there was a scraping down the alley next to the house. Not good. Mm -hmm. um, there was also a lot of frustration in, it was weird. I saw it, I, I remember seeing it on a, in a macro form. Remember after 9-11 when suddenly a lot of our goofy, fun, violent entertainment just didn't seem as entertaining anymore mm -hmm. because we'd seen. So to, to see it in micro on, on one person, a lot of you know crime shows and police procedurals and clever serial killer things, it just that was not a thing that entertained her anymore, you, you know, because it right. was just like, this is not, this is all fantasy. Right. And so that was, it was hard to kind of see her just watch bits of reality get kind of, you know, uh, blown away for her like that. Right, right. I mean, we were talking in the green room, and you said that she, you know, she wasn't always as into this as, as she was, you know, when she was writing the book. I mean, what was the process? What was the origin story of of this book or of her as of a her as, as a crime? Right. It's weird. It, it there's not that again. There's not that cinematic. Oh, this is what I shall be. You know, like it when you watch a a, a biopic. And they show eight-year-old Babe Ruth look at a baseball bat through a window and be like, "Oh, that's when he," you know. Um, it, it was a lot of uh, it was there was a lot of back and forth. You know, when she was a teenager, a a woman was murdered in her neighborhood of Oak Park, Illinois. The crime was never solved. Michelle, teenage, I think, fourteen-year-old Michelle, went down and to the crime scene 
picked up a broken piece of Walkman that she was out, this woman was out jogging and was murdered. And so she picked up this broken piece of the Walkman. And again, a bad movie would have that kind of, dun, dun, you know. The, um, so that stayed in her head. And then there was a, uh, um, later on, she was working on a uh, um, screenplay, a, a very fun comedy screenplay. She'd sold it. Basically, it was legally blonde in the FBI. Like, a, you know, a girl, boom, sold. Let's do that. And she was writing it. And in order to write, this is right when we met. She was finishing up the final draft of it. And to, in order to write this goofy comedy, she still had to research how the FBI worked. So she did all this reading, and, and she got way more into that aspect of, you know, crimes and stuff, and, and was like, why am I writing? So right. the movie sold, didn't get made. She goes, I don't care. I would, this is what I want to be doing. Right. You know, the thing that she thought she was pursuing was actually not the thing, and then that was the beginning of it. Right, right. You know. And um, so what was her process with this case, with this, with this particular book? I mean, how did that start? The thing is... There really wasn't a process because it was it was a day to day thing. She had to invent it from ground zero every morning. She didn't have a well. This is my routine, and this is the process I will follow. It was some days. It was just looking at um, at Google Maps and historical Google Maps online or different neighborhoods. Other days, it was tracking down a pair of cufflinks. Other days, it was interviewing um, a survivor or a family member of the deceased. So it was, it was different tools that she had to use every day. So I basically, I guess the, the closest thing that she had to a process was trying to embrace wherever the day took her in terms of what came through that 13 inch window of her laptop and right. where are we gonna pursue it now? Right. You know, but, but it, was a, it wasn't an immediate process getting there. There were times where she would follow what she thought was the lead. Oh my God, this is so good brick wall and then just a day of recovery and you, so that was that was hard right right um, I'm just curious in the audience who's who's is that has everyone read the book or who's familiar with with the case that we're talking about knows a little bit about it yeah right, right. I mean should we give a little a little <clears throat> bit of a really background? quickly yeah. yeah she this is a a, a a rapist and serial killer that she dubbed the Golden State Killer he had and one of the cops told her um, we named him badly. It wasn't a name that caught on. He actually was kind of laughing about it. Bad branding. We didn't give him a cool name right. like Zodiac <laughs> or the Night Stalker. This guy, this guy's original name was Earons, which is an acronym for East Area Rapist when he was in Sacramento, and slash ONS, Original Night Stalker. So already... The acronym, <laughs> it takes you like five minutes to explain. What it the is. Acronym. So the, the person, they're already like, I'm, I'm not even paying attention. Like, right, right. they don't have this long, right. you know, you don't, don't, you can't have a nickname that takes longer to explain <laughs> than if you just said the guy's name. Right. This is two sheds. Now, right. see, what happened was back in, <laughs> uh, like, just, no, no. It, it's either apparent or right. it isn't. So she renamed him the Golden State Killer, and, the, and one of the cops was like, thank you, yeah. good. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because he operated in two different districts. He was right. up in Sacramento, then he vanished and showed up again down in Irvine and Goleta. So it was two whole different yeah, precincts, so they weren't really sharing information, so they just kind of slapped this horrible name. Yeah. It, it, so anyway, but so... Ears are not scary. Yeah, yeah. exactly, yeah, ears, <laughs> ear on. E Eeyore? No, oh. ear, never mind. It's not, you know. So, um... She, uh, he committed 50 rapes and then 10 murders over the space of, ten years. I'd say, a, a, a ten decade. 10 years, a decade, yeah. Yeah, 10 years, yeah, and then was never caught, despite being held at gunpoint at one point by a policeman. Mm -hmm. um, he would vault over fences. He would run up on roofs. He was, he was a, at one point, one of the cops has to acknowledge that some of the, sh some of the stuff he was doing was diabolical and smart, and then he mm -hmm. has to catch himself and go, but this guy's a piece of shit. Like, it, that, that right. anger, she describes it as like when you talk about an ex-boyfriend and you end up talking way too long, <laughs> and then you have to go, but he's fucking worthless. I'm not, <laughs> I don't miss him. I'm just saying, you know, so. But right. these cops, again, that, and that's another risk of being a homicide cop, is that thing of like, oh shit, I just kind of acknowledged 
three things he did that were, although there's a very chilling thing that one of the cops in the book says, because of the way police work was done in the 70s, he was like, he was smart, but keep in mind, he didn't have to be that smart to get away right. with this because stuff. Right, because they didn't have DNA they testing. They didn't have DNA they testing, have... and they also had some pretty primitive attitudes towards rape victims, towards you know women that were being victimized and stuff, mm -hmm. and that, that, that colored a lot of how they proceeded with the investigation. Right. So right. That, was a, that was definitely a factor. Right. It was a different time. Yes. And, and it different. must have been really frustrating, too, because so many instances in the book, he was just one step ahead. Like, they just, just, there, just missed him. There's all these just missing things. There was, a, uh, there was a pursuit on a guy was chasing him in his car while he was on a bicycle. Yeah. <laughs> but at one point, and it was like, oh, you should have just shot him. He's like, wait a minute. I'd heard over the radio there was a woman screaming, and then I saw a, a weirdo on a bike. I can't just take my gun and just shoot the weirdo. She could have been screaming because she was watching a game show, and then I just like, hey, you just shot some weird hippie for no reason. Like, you can't. So there's, and you, you see that frustration too, like they can't act until they have all that information. Right, You know, right. so that's very frustrating. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so one of the most interesting parts of the book, I thought, was um, Michelle describing one of your movie premieres. Oh yeah. yeah, and um, and sort of being being at the premiere, but also being distracted because she was getting clues on her phone. On another case. <laughs> on yeah. another case. Yeah. Yeah. She well, I'm, I'm going to read you this section because she really and you know this is this is just she's describing a movie premiere that um, uh, that she went to with me, and then she gets yanked away from because of um, what was coming out over her phone. And but these same kind of descriptions, she just nails these. 1970s Southern California neighborhood. She just she's really good at capturing the mood, and the mood oftentimes dictates how people act and react to, to things. This is a perfect uh, case in point. Walking into the after party, Patton was introduced to the directors of Crank, an action movie he loved, starring Jason Statham. He began regaling them with his favorite bits from the movie. I'm Gatham for Statham, he confessed. <laughs> <laughs> I actually said, I that, to them. I said that to them, yeah. <laughs> Wait, by the way, the, yeah, I'm Gatham for Satham. <clears throat> and, I, and I was, and I am. <laughs> After we parted ways with the directors, we paused and surveyed the crowd cramming into the ballroom at the Hollywood and Highland Center. Drinks, gourmet mini cheeseburgers, and maybe even Gary Shandling, an idol of Patton's, awaited us. Patton read my mind. No problem, he said. A friend intercepted us on our way out. Going back to baby, she said with a warm smile. Our daughter Alice was three months old. Well, you know how it is, I said. The truth, of course, was much weirder. I was foregoing a fancy Hollywood party to return not to my sleeping infant, but my laptop to excavate through the night in search of information about a man I'd never met who murdered people I didn't know. Violent men unknown to me have occupied my mind all my adult life, long before 2007, when I first learned of the offender I would eventually dub the Golden State Killer. The part of the brain reserved for sports statistics or dessert recipes or Shakespeare quotes is, for me, a gallery of harrowing aftermaths. A boy's BMX bike, its wheels still spinning, abandoned in a ditch along a country road, a tuft of microscopic green fibers collected from the small of a dead girl's back. To say I'd like to stop dwelling is beside the point. Sure, I'd love to clear the rot. I'm envious, for example, of people obsessed with the Civil War, which brims with details but is contained. In my case, the monsters recede but never vanish. They are long dead and being born as I write. The first one, faceless and never caught, marked me at 14, and I've been turning my back on good times in search of answers ever since. So that's, yeah, her. <clears throat> She's amazing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. I mean, just you know, reading that bit, um, I mean, one of the things that really struck me about the book is that procedurals tend to be, you know, the, the mechanics of investigating a case tend to be dry to listen to. But right. she, it, she made it sound almost poetic. Well, she made it sound poetic, but you have to remind yourself as you read this, and there are some yeah. gorgeous passages in here, but what she's describing are very, very negative effects on her as she keeps going deeper and deeper and deeper 
into this case, into the history of it, talking to the people. She does these amazing portraits of some of the, the different victims, the mom mm -hmm. who, and the daughter, the daughter who is alive today, specifically because she had a fight with her mom that day and then ran out of the house right. and missed when the killer came by. Right. Um, you, the, the, the portrait of the, the, the young couple that's killed and his brother, who is a deputy in training, has to go and clean up the crime scene. Yeah. And so there's just all these, you know, and she really captures how these people were dealing with growing up in that era of suddenly it's the me decade and people aren't neighbors anymore and divorces are happening and, and everything's kind of splitting up. And, in the, and then there's these new um, communities of these, these seemingly stylish, new designed, modern looking houses mm -hmm. that she called them, they're a predator's paradise though, right. because they're designed to look cool from the outside, but they give nothing but cover to killers and, and lurkers and stalkers. So, you know, there's just this, you feel, yes, you feel the sunniness of Southern California and then you just feel some very dark tones underneath that she nailed. And she could do that in terms of geographic history and she could do that with her own psyche as she goes through this. Right, right. I mean, it's, it's fascinating. And I mean, as, you know, w watching her go through this, I mean, how, I mean, you mentioned this a little bit before, but did, did she have... Is she compartmentalizing that a little bit? Or she was, was trying as best that she could, but she even said, she goes, I'm an amateur at this. I'm still learning this as I go along. I don't have decades of on-the-job training to learn to, she, she was learning to compartmentalize as she went along, but some of the stuff was impossible to compartmentalize, especially if you have, she was almost lethally um, empathetic of, of being able to get into people's minds and to, to the lethal to herself I think you know it, it was really you know she I'd, I'd find her crying in her laptop sometimes she would be very quiet for days because she was just carrying all this stuff and you know and she also talks about there, there's a a real danger some of the ways that when you when you find a suspect and you really start getting into them she describes um, finding a new suspect it's the same mechanics as falling in love when, you, when that person's face suddenly fills everything you see. And the language that the cops use to describe a promising subject is the same language that you, you will use at the beginning of a, a, like a relationship, where you go, oh, I'm really liking this guy. This guy, <laughs> he's looking really good. I'm getting a really good feeling now. Like those, those other ones that, no, but this, I think this is the one. And then they'll even say like when they find a piece of evidence, that exonerates the person, they'll literally say stuff like, oh, he blew it. He blew it, I, he was right there and he blew it. Mm -hmm. You know, like it's there, so it's this weird, it, it, it's a, there's some, there's some things you have to embrace in yourself in this kind of work that can be, you know, very, very disturbing. Mm -hmm. There's some things where she basically compares and it's, and it's, it's inarguable that this guy's, the, the obsession that he has for the hunt and the pursuit is the exact same fuel that she and the homicide cops have in hunting him. Mm -hmm. Same obsession, the same techniques. So that that part is really, you know, there's just all these, you know, details that she was able to look at head on. And, right. You know. Well, it's amazing because she must have had to. She, I mean, she talks about it going through all these files and finding these details. I mean, she walked. She walked the trails. She walked like the scenes. I mean. Did you, yes. I mean, in order to be, to have this almost like novelistic um, way of describing it, I mean, she had to really kind of get in there. She would drive around these neighborhoods. One time we went up to San Isidro and she goes on the, we were driving the way back. She goes, oh, let's, I want to go through Goleta and like some of these neighborhoods. I'm going to find, she had made a mixtape on her iPod of songs that were big the year that these murders took place that she just, as she drove around to go like, this is what would have been, you would have heard out of radios or windows or stuff like that. Like that's what was the soundtrack of this time. And the, you know, so she wanted that full immersion. You know, did that have anything to do with, you know, that was part of everyone's kind of mass mind in a way. So that, you know, yeah, there was a lot of the walking the neighborhoods, knowing what was going on culturally, knowing what, you know, these people's histories were and um, and, and sometimes walking the neighborhoods will, we'll, I remember very early, even before she wrote this book, 
she had a, 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 a blog called True Crime Diary, and there was a murder on a beach up in Jenner, and that was the that was the the log line of it was there was a couple on the beach, and the guy walked down with a rifle and shot him, and you go, oh, guy walked down into a beach at night and shot these people, okay, and but then she went up to that beach and walked down to it. The beach was really hard to get to down this rocky outcrop, huge rocks all over the beach. It's like of whoever did this carrying a heavy rifle, and I this wasn't just some random guy doing it. This was a very specific mission this guy was on, and it changed how she investigated that case mm -hmm. from walking the area. It changed everything. It changed the portrait she had of the killer. Because she goes, this wasn't just some random dude walking out of the beach. Something was going on here. Right. And the same thing happened with a lot of these neighborhoods. Like, wait a minute, you can... Oh, no wonder he hit this neighborhood so often. Look how the houses are designed. You can, you know, there's a there's a really eerie scene where she walks with one of the homicide cops through one of the neighborhoods, and he's showing her how easy it is to peep into windows on one-story mm -hmm. houses. And she is like, yeah, this is terrible what we're doing. This is also really easy and kind of addicting. Mm -hmm. You can look in these windows, and they can't see you. At yeah. night, with the light hitting them, they don't see anything out. So it's like this free terrarium of people walking around she goes I can and she goes I, I don't I'm not a psycho killer and I could do this for hours right. I could right. look in these windows for hours one of the best crime novelists we have James Elroy admits to spending most of his teens creeping through Hancock Park peeping into windows he did and he would break in and steal panties he, he was an early ransacker now you know luckily he turned to crime fiction but <laughs> In his descriptions, he sounds very good at breaking into houses. Right. So, you know, there was that kind of, oh, you, you know, how, what, 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 how many bad days would you have to suffer before you got tipped into the world of wanting to, to um, you know, lay out destruction the right. way that this guy did? Right, you know? right. I mean, there was so much, um, I mean, having to deal with all, all of this, this sort of, death and goriness and everything. I mean, what do you think drove her to, to, to stay with this? I mean, she was doing this so, so long. Um, because she had um, a couple of things. I mean, I think it was the being marked as a 14-year-old, having that woman die in her neighborhood in broad daylight, and why don't, why don't we know who that person is? Mm -hmm. And she just, her mind was wired that way. She would... She would spend hours reading about these cases, and then long before she ever started writing about them, she would just read about them. She loved the the puzzle solving aspect of these investigators. She just was. Some people are wired that way, and she and then she started blogging about it and, and helped solve a couple of these. So there was then that got you know stoked a little bit, and and she just it was that when you find the thing that that is for you, it's like you love that life. You love the life. Mm -hmm. And that's the life she 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 was fascinated with that, right. you know. But she was also a novelist and a poet, and so there was a challenge in, in order to, I guess, as a writer, maybe that was also a thing that Soto was. You know, we live in this kind of blip culture, and you know, swipe right and you know, quick tweets. Mm -hmm. To to get these cases solved, you've got to sustain people's concentration, and you can only do that if you can write well. Because right. now we're living. It's very easy to get anyone's attention. It's impossible to keep, keep anyone's it. attention yeah. anymore. And she was able to do that. Right, right. Um, the passage you read, it sort of shows the, the kind of uh, contrast between what she does and what you do. Yeah, <laughs> oh boy. I mean, how, 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 did that, how did that actually play out day-to-day -day life? I mean, day-to-day -day life, it was perfect because we were, we were filling in, you know, get, I was like, hey, let's go to this fun party, great, and then, at night, we would talk about these deep cases and all these, you know, it's just amazing. But I would just, we wouldn't talk. She would talk and I would just listen because this was way outside of my wheelhouse, which mm -hmm. makes this, for so many reasons, you know, for the obvious, it's bittersweet because she's gone. But it's also very nerve-wracking for me because I'm a clown who has been sent out as an advocate for a crime fighter. Like, she should be up here. There's details that I'm, I know that I'm glomming over. I'm looking at Billy and Paul right now, and they're frozen smiles. Guys, I'm doing the best I can, but there were details I know that she could way better articulate than I am right now. Like, so th there's that kind of thing that is a, as a, I mean, it was, you know, she was amazing to, to live a life with her was, was incredible, you know, and, and to, so, it worked out great because I was 
with someone that I was constantly fascinated with. Mm -hmm. You know, what are you working? Oh my God, what is going on? And like, I would see her like there, there was days I would come in and she would just have that look where I'm like, oh, okay, don't bug her. Don't even like let her. <laughs> and then when she comes out, I'll be there for the decompression part of it and we'll talk right. and you know, I'll try to cheer her up. But that was, you know, to, to be with someone that was living at that level of intensity was just incredible, you know? I mean, th I mean that said, she she passed away um, in the writing yeah. of this book. I mean, I can I can't even imagine what you must have been going through. I mean, how did you sort of get together, get it together, and just say I'm going to finish this? And I really didn't. I, I didn't. Get, I never got it together. I just started sending out emails asking for help because I didn't know what else to do because this book was. I knew it meant so much to her, and I knew that this is so far beyond my abilities. Not only is it beyond my abilities as someone that can um, analyze and, and put together crimes, it's just beyond my abilities as a writer. She is such an amazing writer, and I knew that, I'm like, well, if I start writing, on the, you'll, see, you'll see this precipitous drop <laughs> in the quality all of a sudden, you know, it's like, can you guess where Eric Clapton stopped playing and Patton started? Yeah, I, I, you know, I can actually, I can, I'll pick the note. I know exactly where that happened. So, you know, there was this, I just started sending out emails to her publisher, to her, and to, you know, thank God Billy Jensen and, and Paul Haynes, her researcher, and we just, it, 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 I, I just was like, guys, we need to finish this book and it has to have her name on it. What do we do? I, I mean, mm -hmm. I was coming from complete helplessness. I, it was not me going, okay, here's what we're gonna do. It was me just like, please help me get this done. I don't know what to, you know, I'm, I am, I cannot be at, at a lower point. I don't know how to proceed. Mm -hmm. I'm just surviving, so help me finish this book. And they stepped up brilliantly, as did her publishers, as did everyone. So, you know, all, my, my role was sending out emails begging people to get this thing done, and they did. Mm -hmm. That was my role in this. Well, I mean, that said, Michelle's voice stayed in. We I did mean, not how... touch her writing at all, right. because again, we, when we were reading it, we're like, oh, we cannot get our big peanut butter fingerprints on this. I will, <laughs> they, wrote a, they wrote a fascinating afterword that puts a lot of the stuff into context in a very technical way, but still very, very readable about here's what you were just reading, and then I wrote an afterword about you know her and 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 the the void that she's left, mm -hmm. and my hopes that this gets solved. Gillian Flynn wrote a brilliant um, introduction. Gillian was a fan of hers long before the book, mm -hmm. but the book is hers. You are with her. It is her voice. It's her mind, and that's who you're with in this. Right. We just there's a quick little intro. There's a couple of quick goodbyes in, but we wanted it to be her. Mm -hmm. And so, what was that? process like as far as um, going through the rest of her notes, the unfinished part, I mean. I couldn't do it. It right. was Paul and Billy did that. I didn't, I had no mm -hmm. um, hand instruction this because every time I would try to start reading her notes, because it was still still so soon after she had passed, her voice would come launching back up out of the pages and it would destroy me and I couldn't go on. Like mm -hmm. I couldn't, mm -hmm. I would start crying and it just felt like it, it was so, it felt like it felt like a cruelty to to have her just exist on ink and paper and not be there right. with me. So and be there for Alice and also beyond my selfish. Why isn't she here for me? She should be finishing this. Like there's there's stuff that she's not gonna. You know, so all of that was just too much for me to deal with. And luckily, again, Billy and Paul were able to to do it. And they would bring it to me and they would go, "We're gonna structure it like this." And we go, "That sounds great. Okay, good." You know. <laughs> But I was certainly not going, uh, excuse me, no, I think we need to, you know, it was no, you know, I'm not going to get, the, the, I'm just making it very clear, I had very little to do <laughs> with the structure and the, uh, the, 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 you know, the, the, the execution at the end of this book here. It was, all I did was beg for it to be done right. and ask for help and it, and it got done, so. Right. Okay, well, um, I think um, we have... A treat because uh, Billy, <laughs> Billy yeah, and Paul are Billy here. Paul are here, and um, and they're gonna come up and come on up, tell guys. us about. <laughs> That's Billy. That's Paul. Um, 
When you read the book, um, Paul is referred to as the kid. The kid. Because he was the kid. Right. How you doing? Hi. All right. So how, how did you guys, again, um, meet Michelle and get involved with this book? You, you know, the interesting thing with, with Michelle was that I was starting to do a podcast, and I was sitting down at a, uh, a job I didn't necessarily like. I had left a, uh, you know, I was the editor of newspapers and things, but I had left to come out to Hollywood. And I, I, I sat down and I did a search, because I was a fan of patents, and I did a search for patents comedy, because I just wanted to listen to something while I was doing this mindless work. And then, because of the way Google works, the next thing I did was I did a search for, you know, Los Angeles crime writers. And because Google you know, connects one thing to the other thing, she came up and I was just like, wait a minute, I've read her stuff before. And I had read the, um, the, the LA Magazine article, um, which, which was the basis for this. And then uh, I, had, I had come across her blog a, a bunch of times just because I've been doing this for so long. And uh, it was perfect and we had lunch and we started doing a, a podcast and we had a bunch of other plans, but then she was like, I have to finish this book. I can't do this, I can't do that. So we had a lot of other things that we wanted to do. Yeah. And that was really the, you know, there was two reasons why I wanted to help. Uh, the first was that if, if this had happened to myself, uh, you know, I would want somebody to finish it because I, know, I knew how dedicated she was and how much hours she put into this. We would go to lunch every month and we would talk about, I would talk about my cases and she would talk about the Golden State Killer. And the second one was that I, I would constantly you know, be like, you got to ship this book. You got to be done here so we can do this other stuff. So, you know, seeing it finally done, I mean, that's the, I mean, there's a whole lot, there's a, there's a candy store of bittersweet things about this, but the other thing is like, you know, what could we do afterwards? And there were so many other things that we were going to do in the, in, within this space, but just to have this out and have it being sold out everywhere is just great. Right, right. I mean, there was just, there was so much, um, there was a massive amount of files and things to go through. Um, to compile the rest of the book. How did, what, how did you get through everything and how did you try to ensure that things were told in the way that she wanted? Well, we, uh, we borrowed her, well, we didn't borrow it. Uh, we, we had her MacBook for about uh, two weeks and um, you know, it's just interesting going through somebody's files um, and decoding their like organization system um, because typically you, know, you organize files in, in kind of a disorganized way, not anticipating that anyone else is gonna need access to them. And uh, you know, some of it was new to me, some of it wasn't. And you know, we just had to go through um, like the Word documents and uh, you know, find um, pieces of writing that were complete, pieces that were incomplete, um, fragments and notes, and just sort of stitch them into you know the blank spots. Yeah, there, there was definitely there was a lot of places that we would use. I mean, even her emails were poetic. You know, she was writing emails to her editor, and I was just like. God damn, this is good. So I had it, you know, I wanted to be like, you know, put this there and then taking stuff from, you know, she had never really written a, a, a crime feature before when she wrote for LA Magazine. So I think the first one she handed in was a lot of, might've been like 15,000 words or something like that. How much was the, the original one that she? Uh, the LA Mag piece. Yeah, the LA Mag piece. Uh, I think it was like 10,000. Yeah, 10,000 words. And they were like, no, no, this is a little bit too much even for our readers. So they, they, they dropped it down, but there was a lot of stuff in there and just a, a lot to go through. And there was, you know, for, and you know, there were certain crimes that she didn't get to. And that's what the, the last chapter that me and Paul worked on was sort of like, she had left us, she had done this great work on all of this other stuff, but there were also these strings to, to let us out of the maze and help us catch this guy. And we just wanted to you know, sort of showcase those and show that this is how she thinks and how she was thinking this guy is gonna get, get caught, whether it was through geographic profiling or through familial DNA, or you know, just the, the so many of it. I mean, she was always just so, amazed at how many clues this this thing had and the the sort of um, the way that people talked about this is the way people talk about the Kennedy assassination with the grassy knoll and the three tramps and the magic bullet I mean here we have the three-toed dog <coughs> and, and the you know the, the BMX uh, gloves and all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, have you noticed a surge in interest since the book came out? Absolutely. Any, what, what have, have both, I think both among consumers as well as uh, investigators. I think that um, her work in this case has really like galvanized the investigation in a way that you know, hasn't been seen. I think there was kind of a lull in the mid to late 2000s. Mm -hmm. you know? um, I, there was renewed interest after the DNA links were made in the early 2000s. 
actually they began to emerge in the 90s, but there was no publicity until about 2000. So for a few years, there was a surge of interest in the case. And then, you know, um, in the absence of solving it, um, waned a little bit. And, uh, you know, once Michelle began writing about it for LA Magazine and then working on this book, um, I think, uh, you know, investigators sort of woke up. I mean, no, sorry, go ahead. No, there was just, it, that, was, that was one of the most gratifying parts was to see that, you know, the, the case being reopened leads, you know, uh, re, <clears throat> reviewed, I guess, you know, re-scrutinized, and, you know, that was because of her work, and, that, you know, that she would have loved that. And she also, like, facilitated communication among the various jurisdictions, which yes. hadn't existed, and that was one of the primary issues with, with this investigation. Um, you have, like, literally a dozen different jurisdictions that have worked in this case at various points, and um, each has their own cache of documentation, and uh, they don't like to share with each other, and Michelle got them sharing. Yeah, that was one of her great gifts, just as, as a true crime writer, and always, always having been, uh, you know, upset that people aren't sharing information when you're talking about cold cases, and she was able to just bring these people together, and a lot of these people don't necessarily want to talk, you know. You, you're, you're talking to investigators that did not catch the, right. catch the guy. It's not good. I mean, imagine going somebody going to your job and something that you did 20 years ago and saying, remember when you screwed up that report? <laughs> well, I, I'm going to come in and I'm going to write it for you and it's going to be better. And you're going to be like, what? No, that's not cool. But she was, you know, she was able to bring these people together and buy them dinner and do all the kind of things and, and, and let them to start talk to each other. And that was the thing that, that we wanted to come across in the book as well was that that was that's going to be one of the main things that gets this thing solved. And what I think she also achieved that was really unique is like the unfettered trust of these investigators. You know, it took her some time to cultivate it, but the homicide investigators are notoriously tight-lipped and they typically don't just open up and share everything they have with a private citizen and that's exactly what happened. Yeah, yeah they typically don't give you 17 banker boxes of, of, <laughs> right. of evidence that you could put in your child's playroom and then go through and, and yes. do scans and photocopies of and then return it whenever. That usually doesn't happen. Yeah. No. Right. Right. Then I wanted to ask you, um, now that the book is out and it's getting great reviews and, and, and it's, and it's Acknowledge is beautifully written and beautifully done. How does this feel for you? Um, I, I don't want to bum anyone out. It feels very empty because, you know, um, getting the book, you know, getting the book done is, I'm, I'm happy for her and for her memory, but it's another, not having the book done meant that part of her was still around. I know I wanted to get the book done, but now having the book done, that's another, no pun intended, another chapter is closed on this. And so it's like this, <clears throat> as much as it was killing me not to have the book done, the one, the one silver lining to it was that, oh, it could be, the, oh, what if I always work on this? It means that Michelle's never really gone. You know, so this is another, it, it's, it's great that it, it exists, but it's another form of saying goodbye. And that is a little, I'm kind of still dealing with that. And again, didn't want to, because I'm very, very happy for the book. This is not that nothing to do with it. We probably shouldn't buy it. That's going to make them sad. No, <laughs> I buy it and read it. I want you to buy it. I mean, it sold out on Amazon, for God's sakes. I mean, it's, I, I really did. They didn't like, we ran out of copies. So. Um, and also, I, you know, it, it's, it's, I just feel like if she had had more time to work on this and make it a complete book, I just feel like she could have caught him. I really feel like she could have caught him and got what she really wanted which was, she goes, I don't care if the book's a bestseller, I don't care if I get credit, I want bracelets on this guy's wrist, and I want him to hear a cell door close behind him. That's what she wanted more than anything. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and I, and, and, but I hope that if he is caught, and I, I feel like it could happen, I hope they slam that door extra loud so she can hear it, you know? That would be really nice. Right. And I, I, I hope that doesn't sound sappy, but it, it is, you know, if, if you're asking me how I feel, that's how I feel, mm -hmm. you know. But again, you're looking at, these are the guys that made sure this book exists. And, you know, and I was the guys, I was the guy that begged them to do it. So they did it, so thank you. You know, I will say this, is that this isn't the only crime that she did cover. And this was her obsession. This was her white whale. We all have our white whales in, in, when you do this kind of work. But she has a blog called True Crime Diary that has, that she's written about, uh, you know, 75 or 80 other true crime cases. And a lot of them are unsolved. So, yeah. 
Pat, you ain't done. <laughs> no, I know. So we're going to catch this guy, and yeah. then we're coming right back and out there. other people. Yeah, yeah. We, <laughs> I, I, I definitely want to, you know, the, I want the proceeds of this book to, we want to form a, a, a thing called the McNamara Society, where we, um, it's almost like a, I was trying to think, it was almost like a, well, like a shark tank for cold cases, where people <laughs> bring us a cold case. I mean, I, I certainly would I, would, I would host these events, but we bring different areas of expertise together, and then figure out how can we solve this other cold case and, and you know name it after her and because because Billy's an amazing investigator and Paul is is uh, Paul is an amazing data miner and so we have there's all these resources out there let's bring them together and hopefully you know do that and, and, and yeah there, we're going to start highlighting other cases on her blog that she'd written about and then you know Billy's still writing stuff we'll we'll Amplify this, the cases he's working on, and you know there's ways to do this stuff. So, and, and if you like the flavor of, of her writing in the book, I mean, there's a lot more where that came from. Yes, her blog. I was a fan mm. of, of Michelle's writing before I was a friend, and you know it, it just it was an exciting day when she first wrote about this case in a blog because you know these two things that I I I can't say I love the case, but you know the case is, was an obsession of mine, and I had read her blog in its entirety. And so to see her finally, you know, um, address the case was exciting. And, you know, when we first connected, it was evident that she was as entrenched in, it, in the case as I was. And, in fact, we had actually, we had um, developed some of the same suspects. So our angles uh, of, of approach were very similar. Yeah. So do you think there will be more books or more? About the case? And not about this case, about the Well, I hope there are more books about this case because that would mean he's been caught. I mean, there's, there's definitely going to be another chapter to be written in this book. And yeah. I, I have a real good feeling that, that this guy's name is in her file somewhere. You know, I mean, yeah. we, we, we have, and Paul has compiled, you know, lists of, of people, probably 1,000, 2,000 people long, that, you know, probably 100 that we, we like more than others. You know, um, there's a good chance that his name is going to be there, and there's a good chance that he's that she's probably written about about that person. It's and, very easy you know. to eliminate a suspect because you know we have this offender's DNA, so it's uh, so simple as obtaining a DNA sample, and unless of course the subject is dead, then right. that's complicated because they have to exhume them, which we will do. <laughs> <laughs> Legally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. So time to maybe take some questions from the audience. Um, just a quick reminder, at Live Talks LA, questions typically start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. They are generally short. There is no such thing as a two-part question, and tonight only Clarissa gets to ask follow-up questions. So if you want to raise your hand, I'll start with one that came over the internet. Uh, this one is for uh, Patton. Is is there anything you've learned about Michelle that maybe you did not know, but you learned as a result of finishing this book? Um, I, did, you know, she was always very squeamish about um, violence in films, and she hated bugs. Bugs scared her, and but to see her and read about listening to, and, and talking to these. Um, hardened homicide cops and walking these crime scene areas and listening to the details of it and then instead of flinching taking it in as as raw de data to be you know gone over and you know I didn't know that she had that level of fortitude in her for this kind of stuff I mean she was a very strong intelligent person but this is stuff that anybody would flinch away from and mm -hmm. and she did because she was on the case and so it was almost like it it unlock this deeper level of, of strength and courage in her that I didn't know that, you know, she had. And that was amazing to, to, to know that. Um, oh. How do you think Michelle felt or feels about sort of murder becoming so huge in pop culture and that being into murder is no longer the thing you keep secret from your friends and family, that you can <laughs> finally share some of your browser history with those well. around you? <laughs> I don't think she thought of like being into murder as being into an indie band before they signed. I think she was. <laughs> I was in the White Stripes first, man. Um, I think she'd re be really excited because what it means is that these 
cases are being way more discussed and gone over in the public, in the public mind, and it's giving these criminals uh, less and less places to hide. It's they have they have uh, there's more daylight around them, and they don't like that. And so if that's if this stuff can you know if if a, if a message board can be built around some cold case, she would love that. I think she would absolutely love that. There was a question way down here. Run, run, run. <laughs> <laughs> this is probably for Patton, but maybe Billy or Paul could answer also. With Michelle being so empathetic and her beautiful um, article in Los Angeles Magazine is what made me fall madly in love with her. I get why you were in love with her too. With her having said, she was so empathetic, you could see it in all of her writing. You could feel it coming off the page. Did she have a theory, like profilers say that people who have been hurt, hurt other people. Did she have a theory that this person may have been profoundly abused? Because he was pretty young when he started. Yeah, I think, well, Paul and Billy would have a way better insight into this just because of everything you went over with that. You yeah, some good I, I think we take it for granted that offenders like this have not had healthy childhoods. Um, you know, and, and one, of, one of this offender's characteristics is that he, he had a rather small penis, and that was something that victim after victim after victim reported. And you know, certainly this, this probably resulted in some insecurity. Um, you know, I'm sure that's not the reason he killed, um, but that's a factor. Um, I don't think Michelle or anyone else has a clear sense of um, who this offender is. You know, we've considered that he might be a marginal, sort of fringe-dwelling person. We've considered that he might be someone from a you know, degree of wealth and privilege, and there's just no way really to know. I think she always really thought that there, he wasn't going to be like a deacon of a church or something. He wasn't sort of going to be, oh my God, I can't believe it was that guy. It was going to be like, oh yeah, that guy, that kind of thing, where it was like yeah. something a little bit off about, about this person. And, and you know, one of the things that she used to say about the way that he would commit these crimes is that you know, serial killers normally don't enter somebody's home and, and kill them. You know, he wasn't picking easy targets. He wasn't like uh, Son of Sam or, or Joel Rifkin or Arthur Shawcross who were picking targets that were on the street. He was going inside and he really was doing this more about the, he was entering these people's homes and kind of, it was very medieval almost where he was like kind of entering your home and saying, I, I'm the king here now. I own your home. I'm going to, I'm going to do whatever I want to you. And then I'm going to go and make some food and, and cook it for myself. And then I'm going to take whatever I want and I'm going to leave. But for the next two or three hours, I'm king here. I think above everything else, he was a domestic terrorist. Um, a lot of the victims, you know, report the sexual assault being very unmemorable and, you know, sort of the least um, frightening aspect of, of the crime. Um, he spent a lot of time at some of the crime scenes. Some of the crime scenes, uh, you know, he spent upwards of two or three hours um, just terrorizing the victims, leaving them, teasing them, taunting them, making them think he had left and then re-emerging. Um, and I think, you know, there, there must have been something about just like, um, being in a relationship, you know, being part of a domestic unit that that he wanted to attack. Mm -hmm. This is actually kind of a follow up to that question. Did, did Michelle, in, with all of the cases that she looked at and all of the empathy that she had, did she see other patterns, societal failings, other things that caused? these crimes, these murderers to occur, did she ever have any theories about what society could do to reduce, prevent, rather than have to chase more and more people? I, I think, you know, one thing Michelle was open about is that she was less interested in the psychology of the offender than she was the puzzle of identifying the offender. So I, I don't know that that's something she really thought a whole lot about. Yeah, I mean, this guy... I, well, really, I do remember one thing that she said that, that's always stuck with me. And, and this is true for a lot of circos, as once they're caught and they go into their history, anyone who applies to be like a policeman or a security guard and then fails the psych test should be red flagged. Be I mean, really, because these guys, and there's so many of them, want to do that because they want authority. They want control over other people. And I don't know if that's a thing that you change in society, but it does seem to be this weird thread running through a lot of these cases. Any it's suspect that was a security guard got extra points. Michelle. About what? Security. Any suspect who was a security guard oh, yeah. who worked as a security guard. Yeah. yeah, she was always like, oh, I got to be him, yeah. <laughs> or the handyman. Right. Yeah, that was, was a, the yeah, handyman. handyman. Yeah. Yeah. She loved the handyman. Yeah. 
That's why she she, she nailed true, the first season of True Detective. I think she nailed by the second yeah, episode. Yeah, she was like, yeah, it's the handyman. Handyman, right there. Yeah, I gotta do it right there. I see him. Yeah. Yep. That was weird. It was it was, you know. It, it was very bittersweet watching that HBO show the night of because she would have, that was one of the ones that actually follows how it's done procedurally. That's why she loved The Wire so much. It was so realistic. We would watch Law and Order, but she would almost watch it for amusement because 10 minutes in, she would go, oh, I know the case they pulled this from and it's going to be this guy and I, okay, we can, we can, you can delete it. I already, I know he did it. <laughs> But wasn't was, The Wire the only pop culture thing that you guys had in common? Yeah, we loved The Wire. Every, then then we, we veered off. I one time, because she was like, I hate horses and spaceships. So uh, she goes, I don't like anything with horses or spaceships. So, so, and I was a huge fan of Firefly. And I was like, wow, this is really, we're not gonna, gonna be no, yeah, so. Sad, really sad. Any other issues? Oh. Hi, um, got a question back here. Mm -hmm. Hi. Sorry. Um, what were some of Michelle's, and this is also for Billy and Paul, coping mechanisms? You mentioned that um, having all this in your head could be very de detrimental to your psyche. What were some of the ways that Michelle and, and then Billy and Paul would cope with that? Well, I mean, obviously she didn't, one of her coping mechanisms was really bad. She was taking prescription pills to help her sleep and help her get up. So, I mean, that would be a terrible coping mechanism, but she would, um, she, I, I do remember she would try to make a point of, on the weekends, go, to go out in the sunlight and be with Alice or be with her, like, be out where life and movement was because there was a lot of, you know, that kind of cavern aspect of being in a dark room with one little light and you just sort of, it, it's, it's kind of against, it's, in a lot of ways, it's against life to, to pursue this kind of thing. So she would very much re-embrace life to kind of have that. So that, I think that was one of the coping mechanisms. And um, she would try, I mean, she would try to talk about some of the progress or where she was, but there were some days she just didn't want to talk about it because she was so exhausted in dealing with it. So that's what, I mean, that's what I saw, you know, as a husband and as a friend. I mean, what did, did you guys see? Any... As, as far as coping, no. I mean, not no, anything normal, anything different than... It was sort of... I think it was... You know, I didn't see her in the more sort, sort of intimate moments, you know, because she was my true crime friend. So whenever we would talk, it was that was what we were doing. So right, she was right. always on her A game in terms of that kind of stuff. So yeah. I really wouldn't have, wouldn't have seen that. Wouldn't have. Yeah. And, and that's something that, like, I, I did see a bit of a she did take on that aspect of a homicide cop where there was things she just didn't talk about. Like she didn't want to bring it home and didn't want to, you know, so I can understand, I can imagine what it's like for a homicide cop to, that's just, that's your whole life after a while. That, you know, that must, you know, get a little, must be hard to, to express that kind of stuff, so. I think, you know, um, Michelle was much more compartmentalized a person than me. I mean, for me, everything is just a big soup. Um, and, you know, I think for her, what we shared was like the hyper focus, um, and you know any obsession takes a toll on you after a while. You know even if it's like um, something that you've chosen or something that is engaging to you to entrench yourself deeply in something um, where it consumes most of your time, where you don't want to go to sleep because you're on you know following like a, um, a you know a hot lead or or you found yourself in a in a rabbit hole, um, and yet you have this like you know nine to five kind of life to maintain, it's difficult. You kind of just want to split into two people. I think there was a question right there. Um, I was just gonna ask. Oh, sorry, I, I can't see beyond the lights. Hi, <laughs> Hi. Um, it seems like the person who's doing these attacks would now be someplace around the late 50s, early 60s, or mid 60s. Do we know when they stopped the attacks? The last known crime is in 1986. Um, you know, we, we think it would be between 61 and 73 years old. The most likely birth year, if you were to pinpoint a birth year, around 1952. Um, but there's no confirmed activity beyond 1986. Um, hi. Um, I was going to ask um, about the filtering out of 
a lot of the random stuff that may have made, come in during her investigations as a writer, especially with crime. I mean, I think a lot of people in this room could kind of relate to like going to the Wikipedia page and then playing the Wikipedia game and somehow you end up on something completely weird. Yeah. Um, she seems to have, from what you were saying and from you, what you guys are saying, a very regimented and very clear cut um, method for going after this guy chasing this ghost. Or hopefully not a ghost, hopefully a guy that will go in jail, blah, blah, blah. I, I was wondering how did she shut out that noise without shutting out everyone else, if you guys can, a lot the of collective. Times, no, that's a good, a lot of times she couldn't. And a lot of what you see here is her, at the end result of going down all these false leads and false clues. I remember one time we were watching the, the 1974 murder on the Orient Express. And there's a scene where Hercule Poirot says, oh, have you noticed there's too many clues in this room? And Michelle went, yes, that's the problem all the time. It's, it's not the lack of clues, it's there's too many and you have to figure out which ones are important and which ones aren't. And I just remember that moment when she's like, that's a huge problem. A couple of times she takes you on some very frustrating journeys mm -hmm. down things that go nowhere, but yeah, that was a huge, um, it was it was not a skill that she started out with. Everything looked good to her at the beginning, and so there were days where she would get overwhelmed, but over time, she she could focus better and better and better, and you know, but yeah, that was a huge, and that's a problem for a lot of homicide cops, is oh my God, there's so many clues here. Especially with this case, you don't have anything else like it. You don't right. have, yeah. it, that, that hasn't been solved, you know, I mean, you could write a whole book on the knots, uh, you know, that were left at the crime scenes. And, you know, I, I mean, I remember being in the middle of it going, she couldn't have left us something like the Black Dahlia case or mm -hmm. even Zodiac. Zodiac, about oh, six murders, uh, you know. I mean, this is 49, you know, sexual assaults and, and more than a dozen murders in different jurisdictions. And, and, and not only that, if you want to go deeper for, you know, was, he, was this the same guy that was doing other crimes like the Visalia Ransacker case and things like that? So, you know, there is a lot, a lot of material. And to answer your question, you know, she, she looked at it all, you know, and she definitely had her own thoughts. And we very much, when we were putting things together and wondering what we should, you know, there were things that she had written maybe three or four years ago that we knew we weren't going to include because she had said, she had done that much more research and said, you know what, she kind of went away from that theory, you know, so, and, and went towards this way. You know. Yeah, but that's a big danger in homicide. Investigations, too many clues. It can, it can, it can stall a whole investigation because everyone. I mean, in in a in a weird way, that was one of the problems with all the, the JFK assassination conspiracy theories. Everyone had, there were so many clues or theories. They all just started canceling each other out. You yeah. know, after a while, and mm -hmm. that can happen on a. Yeah. So. And and also the the homicide detectives are going to get a whole new. I mean, I've certainly been sent a lot of them over the past week. A whole new set of suspects, suspects that they've heard before that they're going to have to, you know, whittle through. And the, and the one thing that they do, as Paul was saying, is that you, can, you can't go out and get everybody's DNA. Um, you, you can eventually, but it's ge geographically, you can figure out, was this person able to do it? If this person was overseas or something when the crime had taken place, you can eliminate it. Or factors like height. Um, right. Yeah. We have time for two more questions. You kind of just touched on it. Um, but there's been a lot of debate about the Visalia Ransacker, and I was wondering if you had any personal opinions if you thought it was the same person. Oh, mine has changed like three or four times. Um, <laughs> my, my current feeling is no, but you know, Ken Clark in Sacramento has uncovered this burglary series uh, that took place in Rancho Cordova in 72. And I mean, there are a lot of characteristics that are similar to the Ransacker series. So there's such fundamental differences in um, the physical descriptions of the ransacker, which depict a very distinctive looking person, and the East Area Rapist, which don't depict a distinctive looking person. The right. descriptions of the ear are all very vague. You know, you have like um, medium brown to dirty blonde hair, 5'9", um, and I mean, it, it doesn't get any more specific than that. Um, whereas with the ransacker, his behavior, um, his bizarre uh, figure, um, they crop up again and again and again in descriptions, and it just it seems unlikely that the two offenders can be the same person. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, 
if there's one thing Michelle did say is that, you know, this guy wasn't a genius. The reason why he was able to escape capture is that he practiced, and he practiced a lot, and he was doing this a lot, and he definitely amped up. So if he wasn't the Vesalia Ransacker, he was doing it somewhere, and he was amping it up. He started he somewhere. Up. Yeah, absolutely. He definitely started somewhere and started small, then say, what else can I get away with? And the, and the thrill got bigger and bigger, and then he started killing either to... Uh, you know, the, for he thought that that was a better thrill, or to make sure that he wouldn't get caught because he realized that the DNA stuff was happening, and you know, there was a way that he could get caught. You know, as Patton was talking earlier about James Elroy um, and uh, reading Mike Dark Places, I, I just kept thinking this is just like the Ransacker. You know, this is um, how these offenders began. They began as window peepers and prowlers, and uh, you know, um, uh, flashers and. Um, you know, with James Elroy, it's fortunate that, that he became a, you know, productive, non-criminal member of society. But, um, you know, in this case, it didn't happen. But certainly, the first year attack is not the first crime that this person committed. And our final question for the evening. Uh, so this is a, a question for uh, all three of you in your own respective ways. But uh, what's something that bringing someone else's story in uh, minimum of one layer removed to this point of fruition, what's that uh, something that you learned about yourself by doing that project? Well, I mean, I learned how to, you know, but, but as part of my profession kind of deals with inserting my voice, my personality into things, and this was something where I really, really, more than I ever have, shut that off and, and tried to, you know, make sure that it was just her voice and not mine and not any commenting on or anything like that. So that that was something that, you know, <clears throat> it, it's what you do in a real in a real partnership, in a real supportive marriage or a or a you know or a relationship. You want the other person, you want to um, you know, uh, lift them up and, and kind of exalt them. And so it really kind of it brought me out of myself, I think, in a really good way. Um, and just this was about her, and and, and also because because this was a work by somebody that even though it's a memoir, it was ultimately toward capturing a criminal. It was not for her attention or her fame. It was it was for something good, and that felt really, you know, it was very humbling to to be involved in in this and make this book happen. So or to beg you guys to make this happen, basically, but that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I think for me it was definitely, a, it, was, it was a lesson in restraint because you did want, you know, as a writer, you're usually the king of the castle, but then you're using somebody else's words and you're, you're putting them together as, as puzzle pieces and you have to plug in these different holes. And I would always think, like, you know, is she rolling her eyes right now? I think, why are you putting that there? Why do you, why are you moving, you know what I mean? But we didn't have to do a ton of that, but I kind of, I, that was in the back of my head. And then also it was like, man, I got to be a, become a better writer because this, this is this is this is this is a lot to to live up to because yeah, you know, yeah. some of her stuff just for me just too. Was I got to become a way better writer. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good lord. I, for me, I, I guess I learned that I, I'm a little more left brain than I thought myself to be. I, I, I've always fancied myself a right brain creative, and yet um, I found myself using you know logic and, and reason in a way that I really hadn't had a reason to in the past. And you know, after Michelle's passing, kind of working with her materi material and, and trying to, in the, the small number of places where I, I had to patch holes, um, match her style without aping it and without asserting my own was very difficult because she has a very unique voice. And you know, most true crime writing falls um, into one of two cate categories. W one is the kind of justice crusading you know, and the other is um, this kind of grotesque gorehound writing. And Michelle found this like healthy midway point um, where really the flavor is that of the, the puzzle and you know, the intrigue of who is this person. I think she writes in the book about how you know, an unsolved crime is, is a question mark where a name should be and a silhouette where a face should be. And that's the most poetic, I think, representation of, of what compelled me and what compelled her um, into doing what she did. Wow, thank you, gentlemen. Clarissa. Thank you.